Hello guys, hello everyone. So let's continue with um, differentiable functions with derivative. Um, today, you might see a little bit more challenging questions. So just like always, I'm, I'm gonna write down the questions for you and you would have some time for yourself to think about them. And then after that, I am gonna solve them for you. So let's start. Okay, so the first question, question number one, is about a function f from the interval 0 to 1 to r, which this function is c1. We sometimes write as f is an element of c1 of the interval 0 to 1. This is just a notation to say this. So this is just a notation to say f, well, is continuous and differentiable. Also, the derivative of f, f prime, is also continuous. That's what it means to be an element of C1. So suppose F is an element of C1, which is just means that. Also suppose F of zero is zero. Proof supremum of F, absolute value of F for all the numbers x between zero and one is less or equal than uh, integral of f, the absolute value of f prime of t squared dt from zero to x to the power one half. Okay, this is what you need to prove. Think about that for a few minutes and then I'm gonna solve it for you. Okay, let me start writing. I would write the beginning of the solution and then you can again think about how you can continue that. So solution starts like this. So we have this function f from the interval to r. We can look at f of x for any x in this interval. We know f of x is equal to integral from zero to x of f prime of t dt. Well, we know that kind of this integral from zero to x and the derivative, they kind of cancel each other um, because, well, let me write it here, integral of f prime of t dt from zero to x is f of x minus f of zero. But f of zero is zero, so this is just f of x. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Fundamental theorem of calculus. So we have this equality. 
So we kind of need to use that to use this thing we have here. But as you can see, there is no power in this equation. Um, does anyone have any idea how we can bring in squares and squared roots and things like that into this equation? Okay. So as a hint, well, let me erase this thing. As a hint, I remind you an inequality. You might, I guess you're familiar with this one, but let me just remind you. Suppose we have two points in Rn. Okay. So it means X is n tuple of real numbers, x is x1 up to xn in Rn. And y is y1 up to yn in Rn. Right. The norm of x is squared root of x1 squared plus x2 squared up to xn squared. And the norm of y is squared root of y1 squared plus up to yn squared. Also, we have the inner product of x and y. x dot y, which is x1, y1, plus x, y2, up to xn, yn. So these are, all of these things are numbers. The norm of X is just the real number, positive number, norm of Y is a positive number, and this inner product is a positive number. There is a famous inequality relating these three numbers. Does anyone know what is that inequality or even what's the name of that inequality? Um, I forgot, is it the norm of x plus y is greater than the norm of x plus the norm of y? What you are saying is a correct inequality, but it doesn't contain the inner product of x and oh. y. We want to relate all these three quantities. Hmm. So, okay, so I would, uh, I would write that down. So the correct, the correct thing is, um, is an inequality between the inner product x dot y, norm of x times, which is a number, times norm of y. And we kind of can relate these. Uh, so on the right hand side, I have the multiplication of norm of x and norm of y. On the left-hand side, I have the inner product of x and y. So think for a second to see how can you, how can you make an inequality out of this. Okay, can you guess what should be here? Are they equal? Is one of them less or equal than the other one? I think the one with 
the inner product with x times y is less than the norm of x, less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y. Okay, so yeah, you're right. So just be careful that here x and y are elements of Rn, and this product is inner product of the vectors. These two things are the norms, and therefore they're just real numbers. And this is just ordinary multiplication of multiplication of just numbers. There are like two, three, and they're just their multiplication. And you're right. This is less or equal. That is a correct thing. And there is a name for this inequality. It's called um, Cushy Schwartz, Cushy Schwartz inequality. Um, now, understanding this thing, there is a similar, very similar um, kind of generalization of this thing. If f and g are two functions, Two integrable or say continuous functions from an interval to R. If we just formally exactly write the same thing, it would be F inner product, whatever that means, I'm still, we still don't know what is inner product of two functions, should be less or equal than the norm of F times norm of g, whatever norm it is. We have not explicitly mentioned what is norm of a function or which norm we are thinking of. But if I just very, very uh, formally repeat the same thing we had above for vectors, if I repeat that for functions, I would get something like this. So let me go to the next page. And um, is there any question, William? No. OK. So I would mute you because of the noise and okay, you did that yourself. But you can unmute yourself whenever you have a question. So, um, so let me rewrite this. So I have two functions, f and g. I'm still not sure what is their inner product. But if I just formally write down the same thing, their inner product should be less than the multiplication of their norms. And I'm not sure what kind of norm I'm talking about yet. We should explicitly mention that. And then I would hope this thing would still be correct. So first thing, what is inner product of functions? What is inner product between F and, what is inner product of F and G? Does anyone know what is inner product of two functions? The integral between zero and one for F and G. F it's, times it's, G. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So. It's correct. So we define the inner product of f and g to functions which they are defined on an unit interval to be integral of f g, their multiplication of t dt from zero to one. We call that the inner product. And second, what is the norm of f? Well, when we have inner product, we can always define norm because we can define norm to be squared root of f inner product f. Remember that's what we do even for like elements in Rn. If x is x1 up to xn, we define norm of x to be squared root of x inner product x. And x inner product x is x1 times x1, which is x1 squared up to xn squared. So here it's going to be integral of f times f, which is f squared t dt from 0 to 1, squared root of that. It is one norm we can define on functions. There are, uh, great variety of other norms which we can define on functions. I just mentioned the name here, although it's not very important at this point. This is usually called as L to norm on the space of functions. And then the question is that is, is, is this 
Koshirima generalized Koshirima equation is still correct? And the answer is yes. Um, so as long as the integral of these functions makes sense, we still have this inequality. Okay, now let's go back to the question. We, let's go to our question. We had a function from zero to one, from zero to one to r, which was differentiable with continuous derivative and f of zero is zero. And the question was, it, it asked us to prove supremum of our function, the absolute value of our function for all the numbers between zero and one is less or equal than integral of f, the absolute value of f prime t dt from zero to one to the power one over two. Now I want to use this inequality we had. So we just learned that integral of f times g t dt on integral from zero to one is less or equal than integral of f squared. Sorry, here I forgot in the question, it's norm of f prime squared f squared t dt from uh, zero to one, to the power of one half times integral zero to one, g squared t dt. One half. Okay, so have this Cauchy-Riemann inequality in mind. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know integral of f prime of, say, f prime of t dt from zero to x is f of x minus f of zero, but f of zero is zero, so it's just f of x, right? But look at this quantity. Look at the integral of f prime. Integral of f prime dt is, well, obviously it's integral of f prime of t times constant number one dt. Well, I mean, it's trivial. We can always multiply anything by one. It's just like doing nothing. But it's interesting because um, maybe it's better to, for me to do slightly change of notation in the Cauchy-Riemann uh, inequality, I would use, say, um, the functions h and k. I would uh, tell you why I'm doing that. So h, k, because we have a function f here and we have a function f in the Cauchy-Riemann and in our question, and there are different things. So we want to use Cauchy-Riemann inequality. We want to take h to be f prime and k to be one. Okay, so Cauchy-Riemann inequality is correct at least for all continuous functions on this inner wall. Now, because we were assuming the derivative of f is also continuous, so h is a continuous function, k is the constant function one, always one, so of course it is continuous. So we can rewrite Cauchy-Riemann for these two things. So Cauchy-Riemann inequality says integral from zero to one of f prime of t times one, which I don't write that anymore, dt, is less or equal than h squared, which here is f prime squared of t dt from zero to one. It's a squared root times square root of integral from zero to one of k squared, which is here is one squared, which is just one dt, right? Now, integral of one is just t, this integral is t, the variable is t, from zero to one is just one. So this term here is just one. So the multiplication is just integral from zero to one of f prime t squared dt, square root of that. 
So see what we've done. We showed integral from zero to one of f prime t dt is less or equal than integral of square root of f prime t squared. And on the other hand, we, from fundamental theorem of calculus, we saw, um, okay, so, well, another thing is that we don't need to go, well, up to one, we can go up to any x, maybe it would be better just to write it from zero to x, rather than to one. And in that case, this integral would be, not one, the second integral would be x, which is less or equal than one. And so we are multiplying this integral by something less than one, which is less or equal than square root of integral from zero to x of f prime of t squared dt. And from using fundamental theorem of calculus, what we have on the left-hand side, um, circled by uh, the red line, equals f of x. So f of x, Okay, let me erase it. So f of x is always less or equal than, um, I, could, I could use x or I could use one. Maybe I would use one here. It's less or equal than f prime t squared dt squared, uh, squared root of that for any x, for all x. And if f of x is always less than this thing, of course, it's supremum is less or equal than that too. One thing to note, uh, I would leave this to you. We could do this for absolute value of f rather than f, and I prefer this for um, right supreme or absolute value of f is less or equal than that. So basically we use two theorems here. First we use Cauchy, Freeman inequality, which is a very important inequality in analysis. And the second one, it was the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it was an important example because it, it, it uses two important theorems. Okay, is there any question? Okay, so if not, let's continue with the second question. Okay, the second question, um, in the second question we have two continuous functions f and g from interval zero to one to, they're positive functions, so, or non-negative functions. From zero, the range is zero to plus infinity. Suppose we know supremum of f on this interval zero to one is equal to supremum of g and this interval. Well, they might happen at different points. F might take its supremum at one point. G might take its supremum at another point. But anyway, their supremum, their supremums are equal. Now, show there exists a point x naught in this interval where f of x naught is equal to g of x naught. Think about that for a few minutes.
So let me tell you how to solve this one. We have seen a similar question, I think, in the previous week or, um, yeah. It, it doesn't use actually derivative or differentiability. You're assuming the functions are continuous. That's what we're assuming. So let's look at the graph of these functions. Usually looking at the graph of functions, it gives you good insight and intuition. Um, so we know supremum of f is equal to supremum of g. Let's call this number m. And because these functions are non-negative, m is also greater or equal than zero. Say m is a number there. When supremum of f equals m, it means at some point f becomes equal to this number. Why? Because the domain of f, domain of f is the interval from zero to one. It has two important properties. It's closed and it's bounded. And as we know, we call these subsets of R compact. And the important thing is that on a compact subset, F always takes its, attains its uh, supremum. So, well, in mathematical language means on these intervals, the maximum of F exists, and of course, it's, and of course it's equal to its supremum, which means there exists a point, let's say, a in this inner wall where f of a is equal to this m. Same goes for g. It, it, I should say it's because f is continuous. So continuous functions on compact sets, they take their, their, their max and mean, they take their supremum and infimum at some uh, specific points. Same thing is correct for G. Also, there exists another point, let's say B, where G of B is equal to F. So let's say this is A, let's say this is B. So if F is maximum at this point A, it would be something like this, right? This is graph of F. On the other hand, if G is maximum at this point, the graph should be something like this. And as you can see, if I want to continue the graph of G, at some point there would be an intersection, at least one intersection between these two graphs. So there exists some point which they have intersection. That's what we can see. And at that point, of course, because they have intersection, F at that point x naught is equal to g of x naught. Now let's write that down a, a little more rigorously like in uh, the language of analysis. So there exists a point A where f of A is equal to m and there exists a point B where g of B is equal to m. Now if A is equal to B, if A is equal to B, we are done because well, f of a is equal to g of b, which is the same as g of a. So f of a is equal to g of a. So f and g are equal at one point, and that's it. So suppose they are not equal. And let's say a is less than b. The other case where b, b is less than a is completely similar. So without loss of generality suppose a is less than b so in our graph this is a and this is b and a is less than b okay now define this new function define the function h of x to be f of x minus g of x now h at the point a is f of a minus g of a, f of a equals m. g of a is less, definitely less than m, why? So g of a is of course less than, less or equal at least than supremum of g, which is m. 
So this thing is non-positive. Either it's zero or it's negative. Look at h of b. It's f of b minus g of b. Now g is maximized at this point, b. g as b is m. Now on the other hand, f of b is less or equal than its supremum, which is m. So f of b is less or equal than, uh, sorry, I made the, I had a typo in the previous line. m minus g of a is greater or equal than zero. And here f of b minus m is less or equal than zero. Also, because f and g are both continuous, this function h is also a continuous function. And this function h is positive or zero at a. So let's look at the graph of h. And it's negative or zero at b. And because it's continuous, it should be zero at some point. So there exists a point x naught where h of x naught is zero there. And well, because h is f of x naught minus g of x naught, this is going to be zero there, which means f of x naught is equal to g of x naught. That's what we were looking for. That's it. Any question here? OK. Let's continue with the third question. The third question is just a limit question. So again, it's not really a derivative question, but it's, um, well, it is in some sense. So it might look simple, and it is simple, but it's, there's just a trick. And I told you about this trick, I want you to remind us. Consider the function x to the power one over x minus one. Look at this function. I want you to find its limits. Tell me if it exists or not, and then if it exists, compute its limit when x is going to one. What is this limit? Okay, so when we want to compute limit of a function, of course, the most natural thing is always to um, plug in the number. So here, if we do that, we would get one to the power one over one minus one. Well, one minus one is zero, so it's gonna be one to the power one over zero. Of course, it's not defined, not defined, and... So it doesn't make sense. But I mean, in a like formally without, of course it is not correct, but just for a second. We usually, a lot of times, 
we say one over zero, it's something like infinity. Of course, it's not correct in like the set of real numbers. There is no number infinity and one over zero is not defined. But even if we do that one to the infinity, this thing is also uh, kind of not well defined and we don't know what is this thing. So we kind of have to compute the limit. So when we want to compute the limit, we should look at usually two different cases. We should say x goes to one from left or from right, left limit and right limit. Let's look at the right limit. Let's look at one of them. When we would have the same problem as plugging in the number. When x goes to one, it means x is slightly larger than one because it goes to one from right and it's converging to one and getting closer and closer to one. So x minus one is converging to zero from right and one over x minus one is converging to plus infinity. And we, on the other hand, because x itself is converging to one, so because x itself is converging to one and the power is converging to infinity, we really don't know what is the answer to this limit. The idea is to rewrite this function and slightly change it. Does anyone know how we can rewrite this function in a better way to compute this limit? Okay, someone said e to the ln of x over x minus one. Let's write down, let's write the candidate here. Um, e to the ln of x over x minus one. Well, let's see if it's correct. So this thing is equal to e to the ln of x to the power one over x minus one. And e to the ln of x is just x to the power one over x minus one. So of course they are correct. Now let's see if it makes things easier. Can we compute the limit of e to the ln of x over x minus one when x goes to one? Okay, let's see. Let's again try to do what we did before. When x goes to one, ln of x goes to zero x minus one also goes to zero. So here we would get e to like kind of zero over zero situation. What can we do about that? That's also a problem. L'Hopital, yeah, okay. So again, yeah, let me erase these. So the first idea was to write x to the power one or x minus one as, sorry. So the idea was to write e to the power ln of x over x minus one, and then use L'Hopital rule. How can I do that? So here we have ln of x to the x minus one. The point is that this function, which sends say x to the e to the x is a continuous function. So I can just look at the exponent and take limit of that for a moment. So let's say we are taking limit of ln of x over x minus one. This is where we have the problem. We get zero over zero and x goes to one. So L'Hopital rule says this is equal to limit of derivative of ln over derivative of x minus one. So derivative of ln is one over x, derivative of x minus one is one. So this is equal to limit of x one over x when x goes to one, which is just one. And therefore e to the ln of x over x minus one goes to e to the one, which is e, that's the limit. Any question?
Okay. If not, let's go to the second question. Fourth question, sorry. The fourth question, we have this equation. A to the B equals B to the A. Find all natural numbers. Find all natural numbers. Positive integers. A and B, where they satisfy this equation. It's not obvious how it's related to analysis or derivative. So think about that. So let me just give you a hint. Um, since these are natural numbers, A and B, so both sides of the equation are positive. So they are equal if and only if their logs are equal. Take that as a hint to see if it helps. Okay, so log of a to the b is b log of a, and log of b to the a is a log of b. So for these things to be equal, we should have b log of a should be equal to a log of b. It's better to separate um, a and b from each other, so we can divide both sides by a, b, and we would get log of a over a should be equal to log of b over b. And it's interesting, because if we define the function f, f of x to be log of x over x, 
it means we are looking for two points A and B where F of A is equal to F of B. So let me erase the question. So now we have a function F of X defined by log of X over X. We are looking for numbers A and B, natural numbers A and B, where F of A is equal to F of B. And it makes sense to look at the graph of the function f. For example, if the function f is increasing like that, there wouldn't be any hope to find two different points a and b where a and b are equal. Or if the function is always decreasing, we wouldn't have, well, a strictly decreasing or a strictly increasing, we wouldn't have any hope to find things like that. Or if the function is like this, for example. But if the function is something like, uh, well, like this, we might have hope, or if the function is like this, we might have hope to find a and b. So f of a is equal to f of b. So let's analyze the function. So we have this function f of x equal log of x over x. You want to see if it's increasing, decreasing, or what. And you know the tool in order to study that, the good tool is looking at the derivative. Well, derivative of this function log of x over x is equal to derivative of log of x. Say that's ln. So the derivative would be 1 over x times x minus derivative of x times log of x, suppose the base of log is e, over x squared. So it's 1 minus log of x over x squared. Now, in order to see if it's increasing or decreasing, we should look at the like sign of this thing. If it's positive, negative, or 0, it's positive where 1 is less, log is greater than one, which means if we are in base E, means X is larger than E. It's zero when X is equal to E, and it's negative when X is less than E. So if you look at the graph of the function, there is E. Before E, the function is, um, Sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, there is small typo here. It's the other way around. So if one is larger than log, it's um, increasing, which means x is less than e. And if e is, uh, if um, x is larger than e, then the derivative is negative. So the function is decreasing. So before e, the function is increasing. So the function would increase. At e, it would be 0. And after that, it would decrease. So if you're looking for two points so that their f would be equal, one of them, a, should be less than e. The other one, say b, should be larger. Than, and then they would be equal. But there are only two natural numbers less than e, 1 and 2. So A is either 1 or 2. They're the only options, because there are only two natural numbers less than E, and one of them should be less than. If A is 1, F of A would be log of 1 over 1, but log of 1 is 0. So F of B should be equal to 0. So log of B over B should be 0. So log of B should be 0. But it's not positive, possible because b is greater, it's larger than e, and log is not going to be 0. So that case doesn't have any solution. Let's consider the other case. What if a is equal to 2? So f of a would be log of 2 over 2. Is there any b such that log of b over b is equal to that? So log of 2 over 2 is 2 to the power. 1 over 2, log of b is equal to that. Now, do we have any number b? So, so well, I can write it like this. The square root of 2 should be 
b to the power, sorry, 1 over b. Is there any number b satisfying this equation? 1 over b called square root of 2 for b greater than e. Does anyone know any solution? Oh, 4 is the answer. And there is a unique answer. So looking at the graph of the function, which was like this, b is here. There is at most one b. There can't be more than one solution to this equation, as you can see. I mean, there's just one, at most one solution. And b equals 4 satisfy this property, because 4 to the power 1 over 4, you can see it is actually square root of 2. So, well, you can check that yourself. So a equals to 2 and b equals to 4 is the only solution. Natural numbers, are, it's a pair of natural numbers. It's the only solution for uh, a to the b equals b to the a. Yeah. Yep. Two of you, Kevin and Kyle. Yep. Both of you are right. Okay. Is there any question? If not, uh, okay. So if not, I hope you can study during these days. I'm I'm holding my office hours and MLC hours. You can come and ask me any question. So stay home. Stay safe. Goodbye.